Maybe that's his thing. Maybe he took up tennis. I mean, gotta work on that quick twitch. I hate tennis. I hate it so much. I still much. love it. It's so good. <laughs> it's such a useless sport to me. It's ping pong played while standing on the table. <laughs> that's exactly <laughs> what it is. I will happily be on the other side of this discussion. So Whaley's job with the NFLPA is to oversee the recruitment, eligibility, and rosters of bowl eligible players. So that's what his job is. It seems very like narrow what his job actually is. It seems yeah. like somebody could do that other than a, a former pro scout. Right. Yeah. So I'm sure it's a good gig. Right? I'm sure it's yeah. a great gig. Yeah. But my concern here is that <clears throat> he's going to be able to tell you everything about the linebackers, but every other position he's going to ignore. So <laughs> you might see a 47 year old, 12, you know, <laughs> working on his doctorate, playing at a college bowl game because he's. You know, he's not eligible, but Whaley didn't care. He's a quarterback. He didn't pay, to the, pay attention to the <laughs> position when he was here. Why would he pay attention to it now? Yeah. Same with the wide receiver group. He didn't pay attention to it while he's here. No, he didn't. Well, he, <laughs> okay, listen. He, what year are you? What year are you? 13. Wow. <laughs> are you a doctor yet? Just <laughs> Van, you, got a whole, you have a whole bowl game of Van Wilder. Oh, my God. Van Wilder. Uh the, the 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 bashing and the beating up of Whaley has to stop. Guy's not even here anymore. I mean, can we get, can we leave him alone now? It's been over a year. I don't know. I don't like, know if we can leave him alone. I will say that the team, as much of a roster overhaul it is, as it has taken, they've paid attention to the quarterback position, which was a contention when he was here. But the yeah. wide receiver position is arguably the same position as it was, with the exception of Kelvin Benjamin. That's the only thing. The yeah. only improvement piece for this season. So mm -hmm. it is kind of interesting how we bring in a new GM, yet we still have a glaring hole at that position. Yeah, I don't <clears> – <throat> the thing about it is I, I just don't think you're going to need marquee guys in those positions for this offense to work. We talked about it last week. So they did – uh, pretty much the whole time we've talked about it, but they did nothing to address the position. But talk about doing more with less. Dable didn't really have a stud, you know, collection of wide receivers. They had one. Mm -hmm. One guy, he had Ridley, who was going to be – Zay Jones is going to take that role because they're nearly identical as far as physicality-wise. So what do you do? <clears throat> there was no Kelvin Benjamin on Alabama last year. No. <clears throat> um yeah, but you're not – I mean, I get the conference that they play in. I get there's top competition. But the truth is, you know, this it's a different animal coming into the professional game. And, and truthfully, mm -hmm. looking at last year, where are the Bills different, right? We know it's going to be a run-first offense. So does everybody else. How did that work last year? Do you, do you see what I'm saying? Like, yeah. truthfully, how different are we from when Whaley was here? Like, how, I, I get the roster has totally changed, but aren't we still in similar circumstances as we were when he was here? I, and, and do we accept it because we have more faith in this? We have more faith in the process than we did when he was here. Oh yeah, a lot of people. It, it's when you believe in, so, in something that you're doing, uh, it, you definitely it, it's a different mindset. However, I think with Whaley was he was given a painting that already had a bunch of things on it. And was trying to put color in different spots and do all this. Rather than, all right, we're gonna I'm gonna paint this whole thing over. I'm just gonna cover it up and start over. And then put my new paint wherever I want. But they're laying they, they did it where they're laying the foundation of the team. Okay, this guy is uh he may be at the end of his rope, he's a great leader, let's keep him. This guy, uh I know we gotta get rid of him, he's too much trouble. This guy, you know, we gotta get rid of him. Uh he doesn't fit our scheme, he doesn't do this. So they're actually, instead of just doing patchwork stuff, I, like what I said, I think McDermott went in there and said, listen, I have a five-year plan I know will work. I just need time. I can't be here three years and then you, you boot me because we I don't have a winning record. And then the fact that he made the playoffs bought him an extra two years. I really think if he had a five-year plan, it's now a seven-year plan because he made the playoffs. I mean, unless it goes completely nuclear. Which... Well, if he goes three and 13 the next three, yeah, he's done. But... 
I don't think I don't foresee that happening. Like a lot of the like a lot of the NFL, you know, the experts say. But he bought himself a lot of time by making the playoffs, even though that that was counterproductive to what they wanted to do with the draft and everything. They ended up still getting the pieces they wanted. So it's I, I don't know about that. I think the fact that they're laying the groundwork, they they built the foundation. Everyone believes in what they're doing because they made the playoffs. It works. Albeit nine and seven backing in. I mean, it's it's still making the playoffs. And you got guys like okay, we took a Jordan Poyer from Cleveland, who nobody, who a, a Cleveland team that went one in fifteen, uh, and got scored on like seven hundred points. Oh, well, they got him. They got Hyde, who nobody thought could play, even though he was playing in the slot and didn't make it. They're the, they're like one of the top safety combos in the league right now. And that's yeah. because of McDermott. You take guys like a Leonard Johnson who's just getting, you know, spot time. You make him a slot corner. And, and he was very Leonard productive. Johnson. I'm a big fan of Leonard Johnson. Well, there is similarities between what McDermott did with the defense and what Belichick does with his defense. He gives you a role, and your whole job is just to fulfill your role. You're not to play outside a frame. You're not to, you're not to color outside the lines. This is your job. Learn your job. Do your job. And and there's some similarities there, which are very rewarding. The difference is that the offense doesn't trail along with that. The, the offense doesn't fit. It's easier to fix a defense before an offense, though. That's the, that's the problem. Mm-hmm. It's very hard because the, the chemistry – that's why <clears> – <throat> someone said something like, uh, who's going to have a bigger impact, Allen or Edmonds? Immediately? Edmonds. Because it's easier to play that role than it is – the court, I mean, that's why quarterbacks get paid the most money because it's the hardest position to play. So, looking at what the Bills had to give up to get the draft picks that they got, yeah, was it worth it? So, yeah. getting rid of Cordy Glenn, getting rid of Preston Brown, who's, I mean, we didn't get rid of him. He couldn't, he just couldn't well, resign. Truth be, you might get a compensatory pick. He's going to figure into the compensatory formula. Okay. Probably. All right. So, okay, so you're looking around, right? You gave up Cordy Glenn. Yep. You gave up Marcel Darius. Yes. Um, you really didn't get anything for him. Just um, for, no, are you talking about just for Edmonds and Allen you're talking about? No, no, no. Just talking, okay. looking at the players that were removed for draft picks in general, right? And then look at what came in through mm-hmm. the draft to replace. Are the Bills truthfully in a better spot than they were prior to those deals? So you lose Cordy Glenn, you lose Preston Brown, you lose um, Marcel Darius, right? Mm-hmm. You pick up Newhouse. You pick up Phillips. You, oh, yeah. Well, you lose Eric Wood. You lose Richie Incognito. You, you, so you got Groy <laughs> there. You got Bodine. You know what I mean? That's what I'm, I'm trying to say the guys that they interchange. You didn't know you were going to lose Wood. So no. you picked up Bodine as, a, as like an insurance policy. Yeah. So you can have Groy at guard. But that's what you do. I mean, you didn't foresee what the whole Wood thing was going to come in. You didn't foresee, you know, Incognito trying to throw, you know, weights at people. No. But that's the, and then they cut ties with those with, with those guys with at least Incognito and then, then Wood. Uh, you and I have two centers on the roster. Point being is you are getting guys. Are the guys coming in better than the guys you let go? That's yeah, what you're saying. Yeah, that's what. And I'm I think saying. there's more. The guys that are coming in are more coachable, are younger, mm-hmm. and you're building the foundation of your team. Like, listen, um, this kid, this guy went through two coaching regimes. How, what's the likelihood he's actually going to be like, okay, I'll accept coaching from this guy. Plus, we're paying him way too much. I'm talking about in the case of Darius. Right. All right, let's just get what we can for him because the longer he stays in this locker room, the more influence he's going to have negatively on anybody. I think it's interesting to me that when you look at the Cordy Glenn situation, the Bills took health, <clears throat> and, dur- health and durability over ability, Right. Mm-hmm. Because Dawkins is not the tackle that Cordy Glenn is. There's no. Dawkins may develop into a great tackle, but if we're just looking at it right now, Glenn, Cordy Glenn's a better tackle from an ability standpoint. But his availability is a problem, yeah, right? Do you want do you want a guy who's performing <clears throat> at seventy percent all the time, all the time, or a guy yeah. that performs at ninety percent, seventy percent, eleven like, games, seventy percent is a compliment because he hasn't been around for. For a while, we bag on him, but he's not as horrible. No, it's no, just no. the speed rushers that scare us with him. 
Right. Well, and, and you look at Dawkins. Dawkins played his last 40 games in college. Like, the durability is there. Like, he, he played his last 40 yeah. games at Temple. Yeah. He didn't miss time this year. Like, he's very durable. Yeah. So, and you need that. Right. And you need to have consistency to protect the backside of that quarterback. And I think that's all that was. It was, what is going to be the most consistent? What can we depend on? Well, Dawkins is more likely to stay healthy than Glenn. So let's get what we can. Yeah, and the, and the fact is, he's coming into this season. It's just like anything else. If you sign a quarterback to a very huge deal, you know you're the man. In a, in a flip scenario like that is, we traded Glenn because we believe you, you're the man. He's coming into this going, I'm going to be a starter. And maybe he changed his offseason regimen. Maybe he tried to do more you know, the drills for, I don't know, Quickness. But, but maybe he... Uh... <laughs> but, I mean, the reality is, okay. is this team better now than when Whaley was here? What do you... What's what's your opinion? I think the dreaded P word is going to show up. As far as You're going to say poten- from a potential standpoint. Potential standpoint. Well, you, got, you got youth. You got guys that... Uh, you see, it doesn't, it doesn't matter what kind of players you have. If the, if the organizational framework is not there, it doesn't matter who you have. Mm-hmm. You can have an all-star. You can have a dream team. If it's not organized, you're gonna, it's going to be awful. Do you think Brandon, Russ Brandon, was a problem for Doug Whaley? Do you think that's a reason? You because we saw a power we struggle, saw, you mean? Yeah, because we saw Good, what man. Whaley looked like with the gloves off, right? He wasn't afraid to try stuff. No. No, he wasn't. You I, know, I think McDermott gets a lot of credit for last year's draft. But, I mean... If you that exchange, wasn't his job then. That was yeah. Whaley's job. And what happened this year? There were a lot of trades that happened in the off, you know, during the season and in the off season. But when it came down to draft day, they, they were stagnant. They didn't. They weren't aggressive like they were last year when Whaley was here. So I, I think there's some positive things to be said about that. I think McDermott gets a lot of the credit for everything that happened on draft day. Perhaps he was standing there saying, "You need to do this," or "Here, let me make this phone call for you because mm-hmm. I've got this relationship." Maybe that's true. But the reality is that Whaley was the GM at that time. He was. And when there was no leadership, Whaley wasn't afraid to swing. Granted, he drafted Sammy Watkins when he did it. That's the thing I always wanted to talk about because it's very interesting. If you replace Watkins with either Evans or Beckham, he... We talk, you, replace, you replace Watkins with Khalil Mack. <clears throat> like it doesn't, there's multiple no, 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 players no, no. that could have gone at that pick. I'm talking about... Because I did an analysis of the two drafts before that and the two drafts after that over the wide receiver core. No rookies make impacts. <clears throat> no. That rookie class made impacts. Mm-hmm. You had Evans, Benjamin, Watkins, uh, uh, Beckham. Mm-hmm. You had you had a lot of wide But if you exchange Evans or Beckham in that fourth slot, mm-hmm. does that does that change your opinion of Doug Whaley? Because he swung for the fence because he knew there weren't any wide receivers on the horizon coming up that were going to make that much of an impact. And those guys have made an impact. And Watkins was a playmaker coming out of college. I do yeah. not I do not want to discount that. No. He was an absolutely explosive playmaker. He still is. But he was hidden, though, in Clemson. They hid his well, faults you, you kept very 80, well. 85% of your passes behind the line. I mean, But here's the thing. Because you, you, you get on the ball, uh, you know, pass the line of scrimmage, you tuck and rolls. Like he's on fire. Stop it. But tuck and roll, Grandma! But... <laughs> To your point, he was probably one of the most explosive offensive players in yeah. that draft. And look what happened when he came to Buffalo. No organization, right. you're not going to thrive. If Evans came here during that time, I mean, you think I'm, it would have been the same I'm thing? making my home, yeah, I'm making my whole counter argument. He probably would have caught 45 balls and been a problem okay. and been pissed off all the time. Maybe. So it's one of those things because you have the framework in place at One Bills Drive, I think it's going to be. It's it's definitely better. It's definitely going to be better. 